I want to do a real brief recap. If you weren't here last week, you can go to our website and catch the message. But just a few things to help me launch off into this second part with some momentum. I already mentioned the primary purpose of prayer is intimacy and relationship with the Heavenly Father. Last week I talked about there's two languages within the New Testament. There's inheritance language and there's harvest language. We must know that what, what's what because when you pray, and if you're praying for something that God's already provided for you, you're going to get frustrated when you feel like you're not getting it. So when we understand what's been part or handed down to us as an inheritance, it'll change the way that we pray. I jokingly called it a philology. I think it's solid doctrine. I'll say it again. 90% of our prayer should be hovering around thanksgiving and gratitude. Thanksgiving and gratitude will keep our mindfulness of what God has already done in the past, what he's able to do now if we keep our hearts right. Our response really dictates the favor of God being released into our lives, and it's connected to thanksgiving and gratitude. In fact, he goes so far to say in Thessalonians that it's the will of God that we maintain a heart of gratitude. It's not that we're supposed to give thanks for all things, but he does want us to give thanks in all things. And there's a distinction there. So prayer keeps us conscious of the God who invades the impossible. Keeps us conscious. Have a consciousness of God means that you're keeping him on the forefront. He's always there because we face difficult things. We face things that we don't have the solutions to, but the one who saved us has all the solutions that we need. And we keep him conscious before us, which prayer does that. It helps to remind us that this may look impossible. When we invite Jesus to the equation, the impossible becomes possible. Prayer should look like conversation. There's different kinds of conversations that we have. Conversation means that you both talk and listen. And oftentimes we hijack prayer and we do all the talking and then say amen and don't listen for God. God has something to say. So conversation has has two parts. You talk and you listen and vice versa. There's different types of conversations. There's casual ones where you can just have in an open forum where it doesn't matter who's overhearing you. But there's also intense conversations. Those are ones that you have one-on-one that you schedule. It's private that you want to let that person know that you're in tune. You're listening to what they have to say and you're, you're having this intentional conversation planned. I likened it to dating for you husbands that wives want some planned time. It's called dating. Well, we need to plan some prayer time where we're just with the Lord. There's another type of conversation called confidential. There are things that my wife will whisper to me or I'll say to her in private that I would never repeat. I would never tell anybody. And the more that Becky and I begin to open up in that special space of confidentiality, the bond of our marriage gets stronger. The same is true for you and Jesus. When you, when you leave some things in the prayer closet, you don't have to tell everybody what God told you. There are some things that you should just allow him to download and you upload and it becomes your precious time. Intimacy with God is highly important. It's the most important thing that Jesus came to establish for you and I. So we talk about prayer. I'm going to dive right in, but you can't go into the power of prayer until you first understand the intimacy of prayer. Galatians chapter 5 verse number 6 says that faith works by love. Another word for faith would be confidence. We agree on that? How can you have confidence or trust someone that you don't feel safe around or that you don't feel confident in? I I love this new translation. I've been reading from it for a while. You've probably seen it uh, quoted on the screens behind me. But this is Galatians 5, 6 in the Passion Translation. It reads, When you were placed into the anointed one, speaking of Jesus, and joined to him, circumcision and religious obligations can benefit you nothing. All that matters now is living in the faith that is activated and brought to perfection by love. So my faith, your faith, is brought to perfection as, as we grow in revelation of God's love. The power of prayer is something that we've got to get a good handle on as we understand what Jesus empowered us to do. But if we don't understand intimacy, we are not going to experience the power of prayer. I didn't mention this in the previous service, but I want to make sure this ha- happens on, or is recorded. In Acts chapter 19, there's a priest called Sceva. He has seven sons. They go into a house with a man who's demon-possessed. And this is what they attempted. In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, come out of him. It didn't go so well for him. Those boys got beat up and stripped down naked and kicked out into the road. So without intimacy, it's not a matter of, it's the name of Jesus that Pastor Phil preaches. No, you better know the name of Jesus. You better know who that name represents and why. Because power of prayer is absolutely that. It is delegated authority. You don't delegate to someone or something that you don't know. So prayer is delegated authority. Let me go a little bit further. Prayer is power of attorney. Prayer is power of attorney. If you've ever had power of attorney over a person who's maybe their, their, their health is failing, 
that means that when you sign your name, it's the same as them signing their name, the same authority. And what we're going to find is that Jesus gave us the very name of himself to use, plus he downloaded in you a substance that would back up that very name. So let's go over to our very first verse uh, as we talk about prayer being a delegated authority. Romans chapter 12, verse number 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now I want to point out one key word. I'm not usually a big fan of the King James translation. It's not the most accurate, but in this, in this particular case, it nails it. It does not say that according to God hath dealt to every man a measure of faith. It says every man the measure of faith. That's powerful because that, that, that means that, that Josh Baker over here, he, he's, he doesn't just get downloaded with this gargantuan heaping pile of faith, while Andrew over here, he just gets a little bit. No, it says that every person who believes has received the measure of faith. So the question would be, what is the measure of faith? I'm glad you asked because Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 gives us the answer. What is the measure of faith? Paul says in verse number 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith. Not by faith, but by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That means the measure of faith that you receive when you believed on Jesus is the measure of the Son of God, the faith that he operated with. That's awesome. That means not only do I just throw around the name of Jesus, that means there's some substance in the inside of me because I believe. I'm operating from the same faith that Jesus operated. That excites me. Now, some people get nervous about that kind of stuff. So let me just tell you what Jesus had to say about using his name. John chapter 14, verse number 13. He says, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. Get out of here. Is that in there? It's in there. It's in there. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, someone's nervous right now. They're going, Pastor Phil, don't you dare. Don't you dare turn Jesus into the genie in the bottle. Whatever I say in Jesus' name, I get. Well, there is boundaries. There are boundaries and good, good news for you and good news for me. It's in the scriptures that tell us what the boundaries are when it comes to using the name of Jesus. First John chapter 5, verse number 14, speaking of the boundaries when using the name of Jesus. Now this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his what? His will. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. So the question would be, what is the will of God? Well, that's an easy one. Whatever Jesus purchased for you and I on the cross. Whatever the promises of God, whatever the inheritance of God is for you and I that believe, that is how we pray and that's how we have confidence. So, I'm sorry to burst someone's bubble in here that thought, okay, I'm just going to ask God in the name of Jesus to help me rob the bank on the corner. Nope, that won't work. Or uh, in the name of Jesus, I want my, my, uh, my neighbor's husband to be mine. Nope, that won't work either. Okay, that's outside the will of God. Are you tracking with me? I'm trying to use some facetious examples here, but there are boundaries to what we can pray, but inside the boundaries of what God's will is for your life and mine, we ought to be praying with confidence. Jesus in his earthly ministry, he's modeling already what he wants the believer to do. And so he, he, he shows us through the example of his disciples how to pray in the name of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 10, verse number five, these 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them saying, do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Verse number eight, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you've received, freely give. Now, it's obvious, but sometimes we can miss the obvious. So look at verse number eight. The instruction of Jesus was not to go pray for sick people. It was to what? Heal them. Don't go pray for the lepers. Heal the lepers. Don't go pray for people that are struggling with demons. Go cast them out. 
That was the, the command that Jesus gave the disciples to go out as a model so you and I would know what this looks like. Now someone's going, okay, you're stretching it, Pastor Phil. This is, after all, the apostles. I mean, you're, you're, certainly you're not going to lump us into the category as the super saints, the ministry team of Jesus, because they're different after all. They had a different anointing. Are you sure? Because not too far after this, he sends out 70 more people that are the fringers. They're the ones that followed him around, and they weren't the, the 12. Check this out. Luke chapter 10, verse number 1. After these things, the Lord anointed, appointed rather, 70 others also, and sent them out two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Now let's drop down to verse number 8. Whatever city you enter, he tells them, and they receive you, eat such things as they set before you. Verse 9, same thing he told the 12, and heal the sick there. And say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. So he sends out the 70 this time. I don't know how long they're gone, but when they come back, they are jacked. They are excited. I, I, in my imagination, I'm seeing high fives and attaboys. This is like, this is unreal. They come back in verse number 17, the 70 return with joy. You know, the word joy in the New Testament and both the Old Testament, it means to jump up and twirl about with excitement. That's what the, the, the Greek word means for joy. So that's the kind of level of excitement that you guys are having. When they come back, they say, Lord, even the demons are subject, subject to us in your name. That means that where they went, when they used the name of Jesus, even the demons had to flee. We don't need to get worked up about demonic uh, oppression and issues. Just use your God-given, delegated authority. You don't even need to get frothy or sweaty, okay? You can just say it. You got to go because you carry that kind of weight. Now, this is, this is where we're going to transition. That was pre-cross. Now, this is where we go into the example. Jesus has died, resurrected, and seated at the right hand of the Father. And Peter, this particular passage, had the most profound impact on the way that I pray uh, in, the, in the last decade. Because I began to recognize, as a person who, who spent the majority of his life in church, I've been a Christian longer than I've not been a Christian, and I've been around a lot of prayer. I've been, I've been the recipient, and I've been able to give prayer. And I began to notice, as I read the example of Peter, this does not look like a lot of the church prayer that I've been seeing. Let's take a look. In Acts chapter 3, verse number 1. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who enter the temple who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave, him, gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now, this is profound. Now, I don't know about you or what your experience is, but I want to point out a few things that Peter did not do. Sometimes it's helpful to, to use that approach that when we're trying to see what might be different within the, the scriptures than what we, we are doing. You'll notice that Peter, not one time in this encounter, asked the Lord to do anything. You'll also notice there's a prayer missing that we hear a, around religious circles a lot. We hear something to the effect of, Lord, if it be your will. Jesus got asked that question in Mark 9. He said, Lord, if you will. Jesus said, if I will, if you'll believe. So it's not a matter of his will. He didn't even ask the Lord, Lord, if you would just be with my brother here. He didn't say that either. What else didn't he do? He didn't say, uh, hold the phone. Let me go get my pastor. If I get my pastor over here, then, then, then he'll pray over you. He didn't do that either. You know what else he didn't do? He didn't so go get uh, all of his, his faithful followers and get everyone he knew praying in agreement so that somehow their prayer becomes potent enough to get this man healed. None of that happened. There was a need. He saw a need. He met a need because he understood delegated power of prayer. And he just said in the name of Jesus, get up. If you keep reading that, that passage, that, that man goes into the temple. He's twirling and dancing and celebrating God, what he's done. 
Thousands of people give their life to Jesus that day as a result of one miracle. Miracles are the bell ringer to get the attention to the lost so that they might meet the rescuer. So the power of prayer is exampled here in Peter, which is often different than what we see in some of our prayer conversations or within our church services. I'm not trying to throw stones. I'm just saying, I just want to point out some observations. I've been around, I've been around this stuff for a while. A couple weeks ago, I made a distinction between grace and faith. By simple definition, grace is what Jesus has provided. So God, through Jesus, his grace toward us is what he did. Our faith is simply the positive response. That means that just because Jesus died for the whole world to be saved, I believe we have to respond to salvation. I believe just because he purchased everything on the cross, sickness and disease and brokenness and and, and, uh, oppression, all of those things, just because it was purchased does not mean that we redeem it. We have to respond in faith, right? I know that's kind of heavy, but just bear with me. There's an example of this. Your faith has the power to appropriate, to, to, to bring into reality what you're believing for. There's a story of a woman. The scriptures say that she had an issue of blood. Now, most theologians, and I agree with, that this woman had a, an issue with her menstrual cycle. And it had been happening for 12 years. Now, on top of just the, the, the struggle of the, the physical ailment, she had been to every physician she knew. She spent all the money she had to, in order to get well, and she couldn't get well. Now, I, I, I got to say that just having that ailment alone would be, it would be terrible. But in their culture, it was much worse. Because in the Jewish culture, a woman who was on her cycle couldn't come into public because she was considered unclean, which meant if she came into public, she was in violation of the Mosaic law, she could get in a lot of trouble. So this was way worse than just having an uncomfortable issue here. And she caught word that Jesus was coming near to her city. And she made her way to see, to see if she could have a, a chance encounter with the one who she's hearing all these miracles about. In Luke chapter 8, verse number 43, now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years who had spent all of her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any came from behind and touched the border of his garment. And immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? And when all denied it, Peter and those that were with him said, Master, multitudes are thronging and pressing you. And you say, who touched me? I mean, this, what are you talking about? Everybody's touching you, Jesus. But Jesus said, now somebody touched me and I perceived that power going out from me. And now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him and declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. You see, this was a big deal for her to fess up in what she had just done. And this is the Lord's response. He said, daughter, be of good cheer, your faith. Her faith, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. I'm t- someone needs to hear this. When you pray inside the confines of what's been given to you through the inheritance of Jesus, your faith is the power connector between the two. If, if we, these lights were turned off and we were about to have a church service in here and I said to uh, somebody, well, hey, we need to get on the phone with Consumers Energy because we gotta have the lights turned on so that we can have a church service. So, so imagine I, I asked Mona, call Consumers real quick and, and have them turn on the lights to the sanctuary so we can have church. And so she calls and says, hey, we're about to go into uh, the, the building and have church. Can you please turn on the lights? And the person on the other line go, politely, I'm sure, uh, ma'am, we don't do that. We supply the power. You turn on the switch. This is awesome. I'm telling you, you, someone needs to hear that. The power is there. Your faith is the switch to turning it on. She, in a sense, snuck up on Jesus. She didn't go petitioning Jesus. Jesus didn't go to her. She believed that if I touched him, that was her faith, her confidence, I will be made well, and her faith made her well. Man, I'm about to do a lap around here. This is good news. This is awesome. So there's a battle going on with you and me. The battle that we will, we're not going to be able to escape, but I'll tell you, before I tell you what the battle is, let me tell you what it's not. The battle that we wage against is not trying to obtain more faith. 
You don't need more faith. Remember, everyone that believes has been given the measure of faith. What measure? The measure of faith of the Son of Jesus, the Son of God. That's awesome to me. So if it's a matter of, of praying, God, this is hard, this is difficult, give me more faith. If you've ever prayed that, you'd be in good company because so did the disciples. They prayed the very same thing. Jesus having a conversation about forgiveness, and it was heavy stuff. And they're thinking, uh, Lord, I've got to forgive that much. You're going to have to increase my faith. This is hard. Look at Luke chapter 17, verse number five. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. So the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted into the sea and it will obey you. In other words, it's not a matter of having more faith. You can have faith the size of a mustard seed. That's not the issue. So if, if, if our battle is not getting more faith, what is our battle? It's against doubt and unbelief. That's the battle that we wage. No matter where you're at in your faith journey, if today's your first day, you're just starting, you don't even know what's going on, you're, you're gonna battle doubt and unbelief. If, if you've been walking with Jesus for decades, you're going to battle with doubt and unbelief. But there's, there's some things that we need to understand about this. Number one, doubt and unbelief comes from evidence that we see that intimidates our beliefs. Doubt and unbelief come from the evidence that we see that intimidates what we believe. There might be something that you're believing God for, but the evidence of what you're seeing is trying to tell you that that's not true, okay? Everyone is trained from a child all the way through school to take evidence. The scientific rule says that you should find the facts to prove it out. So we're trained to always look through our senses. And so when I'm, I have this evidence by my senses, it's opposite of what I'm believing for. It opens the door for doubt and unbelief. Does that make sense? Now, here's another factor about doubt. Doubt is not the absence of faith. It is not the absence of faith. Doubt is having more confidence in something else than the promise of God. Let's reverse engineer that statement. You must first believe something before you can doubt it, Right? So doubt is not the absence. It's just that you're taking in the evidence that you see and it's starting to build a case for you to have more confidence in that than what the Bible teaches us or tells us is ours. Now, that's what I, I personally believe that 2 Corinthians 5, 7 is dealing with this straight on. We walk by faith and what? Not by sight. Because what you're seeing is gonna rob away from what you're believing. So, the apostles are, are, as I already mentioned, they're with Jesus all the time. They're with their own eyes experiencing what Jesus did. And one of the biggest first miracles that they see is, is after they've worked all day long, Jesus decides to have an impromptu banquet. There's 5,000 men. If you can count their women and their children, there's between 12 and 15,000 people. And Jesus said, let's feed them. So what have you got to work with? A couple fish and some loaves of bread. Jesus blesses it. They break it out. They serve everybody, 12 to 15,000 people with a handful of fish and a handful of bread. And not only does it say that they were filled to their full, they had 12 baskets left over all said and done. So Jesus does this amazing miracle. They got to see it. They got to witness it. And then he says, all right, guys, before you rest, let's jump in the boat and go to the other side of the sea. And that's where I want to pick it up. In Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse number 38, Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? And Jesus woke up. He rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. When he asked them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. You see, the, the assignment of that storm is the exact same assignment of the storm that you find yourself in. It wants to steal away your awe. The assignment that Jesus gave them was simple. It never changed. Go from here to the other side. Jesus was resting in the boat. Jesus rebukes them after he rebukes the wind and the waves because they had the life giver in the boat. You and I have Jesus in our boat. When the storms come, he wanted them to have speak to that storm, to those waves and to those winds, whatever the, whatever the waves and the winds of adversity you're facing, the Lord would say the same thing. Don't be so impressed with that. Be impressed with who I am and me in you. So this is, this is when we talk about the evidence that we see, even the disciples who just saw with their own eyes, one of the biggest miracles recorded in the New Testament, still struggled 
to get impressed with the storm more than they were with Jesus. So as I take the balance of our time and I wrap it up quickly as I can, I, I, I do have a lot more to say, unfortunately, as I see the clock is not treating me nice. So can, can you give me, a, just a, give me, grace me a little bit more time this morning? Okay. So when we talk about the battle against unbelief and doubt, there are some factors that we see within scripture that will help us because we need help. And, and we need to learn how to overcome these. Number one, the first thing that we, that we need to understand about dealing with doubt and unbelief is fasting. I know, the F word, right? Fasting is so important, but wildly misunderstood. It's, 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 it's been misplaced, misguided. And I want to go back to the disciples again. Because as you, as you remember in Matthew chapter 10, I read to you, Jesus has already sent them out one other time. Go out and heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, uh, cast out demons. They were doing the stuff. Well, in Matthew 17, that's seven chapters later, and that's, you know, even simple math for a preacher, that this is after that. And a man with a sick boy brings them to, to, G, to the disciples, rather, and it says that they couldn't cure him. Look at Matthew chapter 17, verse number 14 with me. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. In verse number 19, it says, The disciples came to Jesus privately and asked, why couldn't we cast it out? I mean, they're, they're perplexed. This is a good question. They'd already been doing it. What was his response? Jesus said to them, because of your what? Your unbelief. It was because of their unbelief. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, verse 21 is powerful. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. This passage of scripture, and I want to be respectful. It's hard for me. I'm not going to be. I'm going to be honest with you. It's hard for me because it's so absurd. The implication that has been made around this, the implication around this verse is that demon must be the name of Jesus plus a hunger strike is what's needed to get that demon out. That's saying that the rest of the New Testament is totally out of line, including what Jesus already said when he said, "Whatever you ask in my name." It's the name by which any man might be saved. It's the name above all names. It's the name by which every knee will bow. So if we understand that it's the name of Jesus plus a hunger strike, then, then that's what fasting is for? That certain demonic strongholds need me to starve and say the name of Jesus? I'm trying to lay this out as pretty heavy as I can because that is not in, in context of what Jesus is saying. What did he say their problem was why they couldn't heal the boy? Because of their what? And this kind comes out by prayer and fasting. What does? Unbelief. You and I are trained, and oftentimes, to be totally frank, many of us, if not most of us, live our lives based on how we feel. And that can get you in trouble. So when we fast, we're telling our senses, by the way, you're under subjection. I will do what the Word of God says. I'm going to be dominated by the Holy Spirit of God, not by what you say or how I feel. Now, when you fast, this is funny. You, you might not even like broccoli, so you just say, I'm just going to fast broccoli for a week. Man, you start having dreams about broccoli. Oh, I just want broccoli. That your, your flesh, the Bible calls it, your, your, your sensory is going to go berserk. But we need to be able to tell it what to do and be dominated by the Word of God and by the Holy Spirit of God, right? And fasting helps us to do that. What's another thing that we can do? We need to gather new evidence, we're trained to look for evidence. And when we see something that's contradictory to what we're believing for, it can mess with us. So we need to gain new evidence. Mark chapter 4 goes into the sower sowing the seed. In fact, Jesus says there's different types of soil. I'm just going to read it to you. In verse number 3, Mark 4, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And it happened as he sowed that some seed fell on the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth and immediately sprang up and because of no depth of the earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it out and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground. Say good ground. 
Some fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up and increased and produced some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. The disciples didn't understand the parable. And Jesus told them in the following verse, I'm going to show you in verse 13, if you don't understand this parable, you're not going to understand any of them. So I think we should pay special attention to understanding what does this parable mean for you and I. Verse number 14, the sower sows the word. The word is the promises of God that you and I are given as an inheritance because we bear his name. We are his sons and his daughters. So we sow the promises of God. Uh, verse number 15, and these are the ones with, uh, by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately to take it away, take away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground who when they hear the word immediately receive with gladness and they have no root in themselves and so endure only for a time. But afterward, when tribulation and persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Now these are the ones who, uh, who, who once sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires of other things entering in, choking the word, and it becomes unfruitful. But these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. Some have taught this parable to, to be used as an evangelistic method. Like, I'll share the gospel, and it's going to fall on certain types of hearts of people. I think it's applicable, but I don't think that's the primary meaning. I think what Jesus is trying to get us to do is to sow the word of God to our hearts, the other word for our mind, so that we begin to gather new evidence and plant it like seed in the garden of our mind. And when you're going through struggles and overwhelming events, you need to sow it often. And it's not that you constantly saying the word over your situation is what's changing. It's you saying the word and planting that word in your mind that's changing your confidence. And so as I sow the word, we read that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word hearing there means hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. So faith is confidence, and I'm sowing that word for confidence as I face every trial. So number one, fasting helps us to overcome doubt and unbelief. Sowing the word, gathering new evidence. And finally, engaging your imagination with faith. This right here has helped me tremendously. Engaging your imagination with faith, which I, I believe we see as a model in Hebrews 11.1. It says, now, is this, uh, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Let's break this apart. We learn in this verse that faith is now. Not someday, now faith is. What is it? It's the substance. The word substance there is the Greek language. It means substructure. It's the foundation. So faith is the substructure of the things. What things? Whatever it is you're believing God for, whatever the struggle you're facing, the substructure of things hoped for. The word hope means an expectation of good. Now, this is the one that squirrels us up. The evidence of things not seen. How can I have evidence if I can't see it? The word evidence is a word that means proof. It is the proof of the things that I cannot see. How can I see it and not see it? In my imagination. When I can begin to build it in my imagination with faith, it becomes proof, the evidence that I need in order to see it in my reality. Someone's getting nervous. They're going, well, that's kind of far-fetched, a little bit on the new age side. Bear with me. It says in the beginning of our Bibles that God created us in his likeness and in his image, in his imagination. God saw you in his imagination before he ever created you. If you and I begin to practice in faith, creating it in our imagination, we will begin to see them come into our reality. We are spiritual people. We are supernatural people. This is supposed to be our normal. We're only catching up with what his normal is. That's why it becomes our super, right? So it, this is a growing process. It's a learning process. Prayer, intimacy with God, talking with the creator, getting a download from the Holy Spirit on what affects your life and what's going on in your community. And prayer is power for you. Don't walk around like some weakling who's just trying to play the prayer lottery. God empowered you to be a dispenser of his kingdom on this earth. You are a lighthouse, salt, you are power, you are the carriers of the Holy Spirit. One final verse before we dismiss. The Holy Spirit that, that anointed Jesus is the same Spirit that anoints you. You and I did not receive Holy Spirit 2.0. 
we receive the same Holy Spirit. Look at Romans 8, 11, But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give you life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells in you. The Holy Spirit is not dwelling in this building. It goes with you when you leave. Do you believe that? That means the power of God goes with you everywhere that you go. Back to home, back to the marketplace, back to our communities. We need to live. It's a false humility to try to downplay it and to, and to, and to, to dismiss it. The world needs you. You are the solution to the needs around you. Amen? Okay, would you stand with me to pray over you before we dismiss? Lots of verses. Thank you for your patience. This message means so much to me that I've asked the team to take last week's message and this week's message. We're going to burn it onto one CD and we're going to give it away to everyone that would take one next week because I, I want this to be something that we really get pounded into us, that prayer is vitally important to the Christian experience as we encounter God. And prayer is vitally important to the world who needs what you have on the inside of you. Amen? So Father, across this room, I thank you for this delegated time that we've gathered together to hover around your word, to gather in your presence for the sake of coming up higher, to elevate us in revelation and understanding of who we are in you. That we might not just live for an experience, but we might live in this new reality, leaving this place as powerhouses of God that carry the very kingdom everywhere that we go, that we would begin to step out of lazy Christianity, not just staying in our prayer closet, but actually stepping out in faith and doing the things that you called us to do. God, may there be a boldness to do so as we even invite people to, to encounter you, to, to come and experience what we've experienced. Help us to live this out in a raw and real way. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.